Hey, hey, fancy meeting you all here today. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining online. We'd like a great joke, huh? So you'll just have to settle because <laughs> my jokes are not that great. Did you know that 85% of Americans don't know how to do basic math? Thankfully, I'm part of the other 25. <laughs> I know, right? You're like, ooh, that's a little ner unsettling. Um, I'm really glad to be with y'all. And, and uh, I'm gonna, I keep go doing this series, uh, Conversations with Jesus, and I've been completely loving this series. I mean, it's in my soul and my heart, and I just can't seem to, quote, like, get away from it. And so uh, I'd invite you this morning to flip over to John chapter 11. We're going to continue uh, conversations with Jesus. And this one in particular, I found I've been actually settling in these verses. We're looking at like verses 18, 17 and 18, almost to the end. Um, but I've been settling in this for probably two months and enjoying it immensely, uh, experiencing Jesus in ways that I'm like, wow, that's, an, that's astounding. And I think one of the key things that I see that I think is so relevant for all of us watching online here in the room is the idea that Jesus has the potential <laughs> to disappoint. Now, I get it. You're like, you shouldn't be saying that, right? Because you're supposed to encourage our faith and not discourage our faith. And I get it. I, I understand exactly what I'm supposed to do. Um, on the other side, I also know in reality that there are times and experiences and occasions where I have been disappointed in Jesus. Does anybody in the room relate to the, any of that? Jesus didn't answer a prayer the way you wanted. Instead of yes, he said no. Uh, maybe you didn't, you know, I mean, there's something happened that you prayed against. I mean, seriously. And so what happens, what's the conversation like uh, with Jesus when we're disappointed in him? And if you haven't been disappointed in him, then save this for somebody who has. <laughs> or maybe put it on the back burner just in case down the road it might happen. Um, what do we do with that? What do we do if, when Jesus disappoints us? And I know we sing songs and we preach faith and, and all that. And I'm 100% for it. But in the meantime, there are seasons, experiences, when Jesus didn't do what we, we wanted. He didn't meet our expectations. <laughs> Have you ever had a performance review where somebody said didn't meet expectations? <laughs> or you did a survey, didn't meet expectations? And, and so what happens when Jesus doesn't meet our expectations? And that's exactly what happens in John chapter 11. How do you have a conversation with Jesus? What does that look like, uh, authentic conversation, when Jesus doesn't meet your expectations? So in John chapter 11, at the very beginning of the chapter, you read, this is Martha and Mary, and they send a message to Jesus because he's somewhere in some remote village, and they tell him, the one you love, this is their brother Lazarus, the one you love is sick. And so they're... The implication is, can you hustle your wrestle and come over here and heal our brother? <laughs> like, get over here quick, because he's sick. Um, but Jesus doesn't hustle his wrestle, and he stays where he is, and he has an interesting conversation after some days. He tells his disciples who are with him, he says, hey, you know, we're going to go see Lazarus um, because he's sleeping, and we know that he's been sick. And the disciples say to him, well, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. And Jesus says, well, actually, he died. Uh, and then Thomas says this weird thing, well, let's go and die with him. And I'm like, what, what are you smoking? That's like crazy talk. But, so it's a little bit weird. And I like that it's a little bit weird because Thomas has been with Jesus for like probably two years by this point. So he says some stupid, crazy things. And for some of us who have followed Jesus for a little while, sometimes we say stupid, crazy things too, right? So it's nice to have a fellow compatriot that makes it in the Bible that says stupid stuff as well. Nevertheless, a little rabbit trail. But Jesus shows up in Bethany. That's where Lazarus, Martha, Mary live. Jesus shows up. And in verse 17, you read that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> Jesus has not met their expectations, clearly. Now, spoiler alert, a lot of us know Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Spoiler alert. But I don't want us to miss the reality of the experience and the conversations that happen between Martha and Jesus, 
Mary and Jesus, including some of the Jews in Jesus, so that we can participate and we understand and recognize that Jesus can have authentic, real conversations in the midst of us being disappointed with him. I think that's super important. So the first conversation happens between Jesus and Martha. And we know these guys are buddies because back in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, Jesus has dinner at Martha and Mary's house. Martha's serving, you know, hosting, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him teach her. Martha says, make Mary help me. Remember this? And Jesus says, Mary's chosen the one thing, won't be taken, all that. So they're friends. They're buddies. So much so that Jesus will make his way, go out of his way, and walk for some days to get to their home because Lazarus, the one he loves, is sick. So when Martha hears that Jesus is coming, Jesus is, is in the vicinity, she goes out to meet him. And I want you to recognize that the Bible also says that uh, a bunch of Jews had come to their home to comfort Martha and Mary in the loss of their brother because Bethany was pretty close um, to Jerusalem. So when Martha hears that Jesus is in the vicinity, she goes out to meet him and she says to him in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know that whatever you ask God, he will give it to you. And I, I recognize and I, I think it's really important because in these conversations with Jesus, Martha and Mary, I would consider are some of his closest followers. I mean, he has a couple meals with them, and, and you see kind of the interaction, dialogue. They're some of his closest followers. They're not obviously the 12 disciples, but, I mean, Jesus is going to make his way, go out of his way to get to their house to, you know, visit Lazarus, as well as eat their home, all this stuff. Anyways, so Martha says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will answer you. He will give it to you. And I like how Jesus responds because this is, in essence, an interesting conversation. It's a dialogue. And appreciate that not only is there dialogue for the, the death that Jesus didn't, didn't, raise, didn't heal Lazarus, so there's grief there from the loss of Lazarus, and there's also disappointment in Jesus. And so this is an, a rational conversation particularly compared to Mary so Jesus says to her your brother in verse 23 your brother will rise again and Martha said I know he'll rise in the resurrection at the last day and Jesus says 25 I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me yet though he dies he will live and so in the midst of this grief and loss Martha has an interesting conversation with Jesus and Jesus reveals to her and, and you don't see a whole lot of emotion in this conversation it feels somewhat logical and somewhat rational if you will uh, dialogue using words interaction and Jesus revealing to her who he is and this whole idea of resurrection Jesus is the one that puts that in the water so Martha anticipated healing and Jesus was too late, delayed, delinquent. And I think for all of us in the room online, we have all asked Jesus to do something, intervene, participate, and maybe there was a delay or the window of opportunity closed. Jesus was delinquent. Anybody relate to this? Like a foreclosure, like somebody dies. So... That's exactly what she's doing with Jesus. And they're having a relatively rational, non-emotional, you don't read a whole bunch of emotion in this. And I like that because I think there are many of us in the room online, we're, we're, more, we're less emotionally organized and we're more rationally, we think more with our, with our intellect and less, is, less feeling to, to what we experience. I see that with my kids. One of my kids is particularly very, very rational and kind of logical, and, and, and he's not, she's not, I don't want to give it away, <laughs> detached or uncaring. This person is just a little more, more rational. And one of my kids is a little more emotional, and that's good. 
There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I would propose to you that your best, most authentic self is who, real self, is who needs to have the conversations with Jesus. We don't need to be somebody else. Oh, I wish I was more like blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Be who you are for the best conversations with Jesus, your most authentic self. And that's who Martha was. She's like, well, and he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And, and they have this really amazing conversation between them. And it's, it's revealing to Martha who she, she had never known, anticipated. She didn't expect Jesus to be the resurrection. She expected him to be the healer, right? So she wanted him to heal, but Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. Do you believe this? And I like what she says in verse 27. Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one who has come into the world. And then after that, she goes back. So this is a, an interesting dialogue and conversational using words and interaction. And I think he left her with a lot of food for thought. Like, what on earth is he talking about? Resurrection. That's really, I don't get it. I mean, if I was her, that's what I would have been thinking. Anybody relate to that? I don't know what, uh, mm, resurrection. Uh, maybe. So um, I think she, as she went back, because it says she went back to find Mary, her sister. And all the Jews who had come to comfort these sisters in the loss of their brother were with Mary. And Mary is weeping and crying. And Martha says to her on the sly, hey. And I like what she says. The teacher. And remember, that's how Mary first met Jesus. As a teacher, she was sitting at his feet as a student, him teaching her. And so both of these ladies, these sisters, they knew Jesus as the teacher and they knew Jesus as the healer. But Jesus is trying to kind of blow out the boundaries, <laughs> go beyond the expectations and exceed. But it's a struggle for them. And the reality family is it's a struggle for us as well. We want and we believe, and in our better moments, we know. But in truth, a lot of our day-to-day -day is, is, can be a challenge. Can Jesus really be who he is and do what he does? And when, when we don't see it in the reality in the moment now, how do we navigate that? And so that's exactly what Martha and Mary are going through. So Martha says to Mary, the teacher is here and calling for you. So she jumps up. And she runs out to where Martha had met Jesus. And it says the Jews who were with her saw her jump up and they thought, oh, she's going to the tomb to cry at the tomb. So she runs over and falls when she sees Jesus. She falls at his feet and she says to him, Lord, verse 32, if you had been here, <laughs> my brother would not have fill in it in, would not have what? Tell me. Died. Exactly verbatim what her sister said. But I want you to appreciate this conversation. The conversation Jesus had with Martha was very using words, interaction, dialogue. And, and there was back and forth. The conversation Jesus has with Mary uses emotions. Emotions more than words. Because it says she fell at his feet weeping. And all the Jews who were with her were weeping. Now, there's two words for weep here in the Greek, and both words are used. The, words that, the word that is used for Martha or Mary's weeping and the Jews who are weeping are this massive outpouring, very, very loud, expressive grieving that is, is very, very vocal, demonstrative. It's wailing. So you hear it, you see it, you can feel the tears. I mean, it is, and you have a boatload of these Jews along with them. So this is a very loud expression, outpouring of grief. They are weeping. And recognize in the conversation with Martha, there were words used. But in this conversation, emotions are used. Because it says Jesus saw, the, saw Mary weeping. And the Jews with her. And he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty four. 34. 
So this was an emotional conversation. And I want you to see that because some of us in the room and some of us online, we're emo more emotionally wired up. And just because we don't have those words and, and dialogue and, and what seems to be more logical, rational conversation doesn't invalidate who we are. And for some of us in the room that are rational and we use words and we're more logical, just because somebody else is emotional doesn't invalidate who we are. Jesus speaks with us, has conversations with us, exactly how we're organized on the inside. If you're more emotional and that's your hardwiring, fantastic. Be the best you you can be. Be most authentic that you possibly can be. If you're more rational, fantastic. Be the best you that you can be. But be real. Be authentic. Because Jesus has honest conversations with us, how we're wired up. And you don't see him say, shame on you for being over emotional and too, too dramatic. Dial that back. Or he doesn't say, what's wrong with you? How come you're so detached and disconnected? Why aren't you more emotional? Jesus doesn't do any of that. He likes you. He thinks you're smoothie groovy. He thinks you're fun to hang out with no matter how unraveled, no matter what. But I want you to appreciate that Jesus participated in the conversation that revolved around emotions every bit as much as he could participate in the conversation that used words. Jesus participates with us in the way we're internally organized, are, are fearfully, wonderfully made. But I recognize that Jesus, it says he wept. And the word that's used here is different than the one that's grieving and the vocal, vocal really loud one. This one is... He shed a tear. And then the Jews who are with Jesus, well, I'll do that in a minute, but I want you to think about this. Why? It says when Jesus saw the Jews and Mary who were weeping, grieving, and wailing, he was disturbed. Jesus wasn't disturbed that Lazarus was dead. They were, but he was not. Jesus was disturbed and upset with their grief. He was moved by their emotions. I, I am fully confident that Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. That was the conversation with Martha. So he wasn't grieving the loss and the mourning and the, and the absence of Lazarus. He was deeply moved by the emotional expression outpouring that he saw and felt and heard. And I love that Jesus is moved by what moves us, by what gets under our skin, by what bothers us, by the things that are disturbing and cause us to be unsettled. That bothers Jesus. I love that because I think Jesus comes into our conversations and participates and recognizes and he feels and he can uh, empathize with us. So when Jesus saw the Jews who were with Mary mourning, as well as Mary, it says he was disturbed. And it says he wept. Now notice this. I would say Martha and Mary would be some of Jesus' closest followers. I would say the Jews who came to support Martha and Mary would be spectators, you know, at a distance maybe with Jesus. But they watched Jesus weep. And this is what they said. See how much he loved Lazarus. The Jews recognized that Jesus loved Lazarus. The sisters said, the one you love is sick. Everybody knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. And I bring that to your attention because I think a lot of us in the room, a lot of us online, we know that Jesus loves us. That's not a question. Jesus, we, Jesus completely loves us. And then the Jews basically said the same thing. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind, could not he have prevented this guy from dying? Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. They said, in, in, in essence, the same thing that the two sisters said. Everybody had a common level of knowledge about Jesus. And they agreed. He loves Lazarus. And he could have healed, prevented this death. He could have healed Lazarus. Everybody agreed on that. And I think that's true for us as well. We often recognize Jesus loves us, 
And we know that he can do the miracles and do the healing. That's a common thing. But I want us to appreciate that sometimes what we have in mind for Jesus to do is limited and confined by our human experience. We, we take all of, all, and we, we live in time. We live in, in bounded existence, flesh and body. And we, we have internet and Google and we can do all kinds of Zoom things and be anywhere on the planet, sort of, right? Remote, vicarious, whatever. But, but the reality is we are defined and limited and we have that in our mind. And because of that, I think we project that onto Jesus and say, he can't do this stuff. It's too late. That window, nothing. And, and, and so we, and we have these expectations. And Jesus is saying, I recognize that you think I'm going to do it this way, your way, what you anticipate. But I'd like to kind of blow your mind. <laughs> I'd like to go exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you could ask or think. Would you give him that opportunity? And for some of the things that seem like that boat sailed in, its, in the past, well, maybe it's something Jesus wants to change on the inside of you, the way you see things and your anticipation. And maybe blow out some of those limits and constraints and boundaries, restrictions. And Jesus says, and I love this, he says, where, where did you lay him? And they say, come and see. So he goes to the tomb and he says, roll away the stone. Classic Martha, got a lover, all things practical, Lord. He's been dead for four days, and he smells. <laughs> I think in the King James it says, he stinketh, <laughs> which would seem accurate. I love her, right? Rigor mortis, he's starting to decompose, and, you know, there's a stone, so the, you know, animals don't. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed in me, you would see the glory of God? And then he, said, he lifts his eyes to heaven and says, Father, I thank you that you hear me. Not that you always hear me, but for the benefit of those around me, so they know that you sent me, thank you. And then Jesus turns to the open tomb, and he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> if you are the Jews, and if you're Martha, I don't know if Mary was there or not, but can you imagine what that's like? For them to stand there, he could heal. He could heal that get guy if he wasn't. It wasn't late, and now suddenly we've moved past healing and we moved into resurrection. They didn't anticipate that. Like, are you kidding me? I think some of them beat their pants, legitimately. Like, ah, it's the zombie apocalypse for real. It's not just a thing. Because he comes hopping out, and I love what Jesus says. Loose him and let him go. And the reason he says that is because his feet were bound, his hands were bound, and there was a cloth around his head. And that's what happens with death. It constricts our mobility. It restricts our ability to do things, to achieve, to accomplish. And it changes our thinking. It changes our outlook. And Jesus, with his resurrection power, who he is, wants to loose you and let you go. Wants to bring into your life new thinking, new mobility, new effectiveness. But we have to have the honest conversations and not live in denial. Well, you know, that's not faith. Maybe. But I, I think that honesty, Jesus says Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And I think that truth and honesty is a massive platform springboard for letting Jesus be truly, authentically who he really is. So when you think about this, I'd ask you to do a couple of takeaways for you to consider. Number one, I'd like for you to think about delays <laughs> and disappointments and delinquency. Let's be careful. Be careful how you think of those things. Jesus is too late. It's delayed. It's not happening. It's the right timeline. And the boat sailed. It's over. It's past. Jesus doesn't do over, past, delinquent. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's, his timing is completely perfect. So let's be careful about your thinking. Your thinking. A lot of times it doesn't have to do anything with the external situation. It has more to do with how you think. 
And that's part of why Jesus says, release him and let him go. Change your thinking. Number two, conversations with Jesus. Let Have conversations with Jesus based on who you are. Based on the unique, wonderful design in yourself. If you're the more rational, logical, if you're the more emotional, demonstrative, be you and have that authentic. And you say, well, I can't do it. You know, sit in your car and do that conversation. You're like, I don't want people to hear or see or whatever. Okay, fine. But find an opportunity, a platform, a place where you can have authentic, real conversations. Let your hair down and just be authentic and, and, and vulnerable transparent with Jesus and over some of the stuff that's happened in the past you I'm angry with you you disappointed me here I'm frustrated how come and Jesus may answer and give you some whys Jesus may come in but I guarantee you if you have some of those authentic conversations Jesus is going to come back and talk with you in it and give you some freedom set you free in a new trajectory set you free in some new activities and set you free in your thinking because Jesus is the resurrection. And finally, hmm, do, you, do you have room for Jesus to wholly be himself in your life? The Jews that came to mourn with Martha and Mary, they had room in their life for Jesus to be the healer. Martha and Mary had room in their lives for Jesus to be the teacher. But Jesus, I think, would like to <laughs> kind of blow out the cobwebs and fully, thoroughly be himself in your life, in your thinking, in your heart, in your emotions, in your choices, in your priorities, in your values. Are you willing to let Jesus wholly and fully be himself, the resurrection and the life, even in your own dead thinking? And in the midst of all this, let's not forget Martha and Mary, the two sisters, having Jesus do conversations with them. The Jews watching Jesus <laughs> weep. But the dude that has the most experience in this whole thing is Lazarus. <laughs> and we don't hear anything from Lazarus. All we know is he comes hopping out of the tomb and Jesus has let him go. Maybe some of us are Lazarus. And it's time for Jesus to breathe resurrection into our lives, into our hearts, into our thinking, into our outlook, and give us a free, truly free, and non-death-filled life. How many of you could say yes to Jesus being holy who he is? So let's, let's ask Jesus. I, I ask you as we finish today, just to think of one area in your life, not a person, just something in your own thinking that ha might have death, death, finality, conclusion, hopeless. It's, it's a dead end in your own thinking. Whatever situation, your own thought life that says hopeless or dead, I'd like for you just to kind of symbolically put that in your hand. And we're going to lift that up to Jesus. And we're going to invite resurrection and life. And, and whether Jesus changes the situation, more so changes our thinking. And that we can open ourselves up for those conversations with Jesus. So let's just lift that up right now. I thank you, Jesus, for each person in the room, each person online watching. And we lift up to you this thing that is dead. Dead thinking, limited, finite. I thank you, Jesus, that you love us, that you teach us, and that you heal us. And Jesus, we invite you to be resurrection life in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our, in our thinking, our mind, our souls. Resurrection. I pray for each of us in the room watching online, you would help us to have authentic, real conversations with you and to listen and to sense you and to feel you and to experience you authentically in how we're organized, whether through conversation and words or through emotions. We invite you to participate, engage, converse with us 
in those places and thoughts where there's death and a dead end. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our resurrection and you set us free to live and move and have our being in you, to go abundantly beyond all that we could ask, think, or anticipate. Thank you, Jesus, that truly you exceed our expectations and our hopes, our desires. Thank you for being our resurrection and our life. In Jesus' name, amen.